times when my faith is in the drought Your grace is enough when I lack trust I believe, yeah I believe From the trials of everyday life to false prophets Or using the gospel as a means to gain profit They all stay knocking at the door of the heart Like grocery carts, you leave empty just the way you start so stand firm like Job through the test of faith. Whatever you face, know he is our strength, so don't flake. Don't and flake. don't be swayed by the wind of new doctrines. They all look appealing but to the body is toxic. I used to speak as a child and think as a child until I put away childish things and reasonings. Now I think like a man. Admit when I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Get biblical wisdom, not advice from Steve Harvey. Now I see in part and things may look dim But struggles produce faith when we hope in Him the Lord. Though I plan everything I won't understand That's why I leave it in the hands of the God man. Well good morning family And welcome to the second week of our second series together Why Are We Here? And if you were here last week You know that we began asking the question The question that seems to be on so many of our hearts what on earth am I here for? And as a congregation, we began to ask the question again, why are we here? Why are we as Sloan's Lake Community Church entering into our 130th year of ministry in this community here on this earth, in this city, on this plot of land and in this neighborhood? And last week we unveiled our new vision statement, the, the why that sits behind everything else that we do and it's simply this, helping people live Jesus-centered lives. Helping people live Jesus-centered lives. Now, as you've already seen, we are so blessed this morning to have what represents over 30 years of, of pastoral leadership in this church with Pastor Ed and Pastor Gordon, my predecessor, my predecessor's predecessor. And I think that they would agree with me when I say that this vision statement, although we say it's new, as in we're putting new words to it, this is far from a new concept for this church, for this congregation. We have been helping people live Jesus-centered lives for 130 years. In fact, it was the fall of 1876 that Alexander Graham Bell made the world's first completed phone call to his secretary. And about 11 years later, in the fall of 1887, a man by the name of James Pollock came across an issue of the Gospel Trumpet magazine. At the time, it was the primary method of communication for this very young, very new group called the Church of God. James Pollock was convinced and convicted that this was the message that Denver, Colorado needed to hear. And so he sacrificially gave $100 and sent it to the editors of the Gospel Trumpet, asking them to send someone to come here. Now, you hear $100 and sacrificial, and those don't necessarily go together as much today. If you go to lunch and you have more than two people with you, you're probably going to spend $100 today. But back then, and adjusted for inflation, $100 would be $2,500 today. And so the heart, the seed that was planted at the very first moment, the very first act as not only our congregation, but the entire Church of God movement in Colorado was one of generosity with a heart to reach the people God misses most and show them what it means to live with Jesus at the center of their lives, to live in holiness and to live in unity. Last week, we, we talked about the big idea. Jesus said, you can pretty much hang your life on three things. You can center your life on one of three things. It can be the self, which is what we talked about last week. And if our story is the subject of this world, then it's a pretty small story. It can be others, which we'll talk about a little bit today, or it can be on God. And our calling is to help people live Jesus-centered lives. But if Jesus is to be the center of our lives, maybe we should look at what he did with others. And so I would encourage you this morning to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. If you don't have a Bible, you are more than welcome to grab one of the Bibles in the pew in front of you. Uh, that's yours. You can keep it, take it with you. Please read it. Or you can also download on your phone or electronic device the YouVersion Bible and follow along. So Luke chapter 10. Last week we saw a religious leader trying to trap Jesus, trying to trick him, trying to get him in a spot where he could then 
allowed these other Pharisees to at least dethrone Jesus in some ways, if not kill him. And this week, I think you'll see something very similar. But the trick, the difference in this conversation is where it starts. You see, we, we have the same. An expert in the law stood up. And what is he going to do? He's testing Jesus. But look at his sentence. Look at the way it's even structured. He says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Right away, we know this man has himself as the bullseye the center of the bullseye. He's already telling us what his life is about. And so how does Jesus respond? He doesn't give him immediate answer. He says, you're the expert in the law. You're the, you're the big wig. You're the head honcho. How does the law read to you? And so the man answers. And it sounds very similar to what Jesus said last week. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. And then he adds this little bit onto it, and love your neighbor as yourself. There's a chance he'd been listening to what Jesus was saying. And so Jesus says, Goldstar, you have answered correctly. And then he just hits him with this. He says, do this and you will live. Now I want to take just a moment, just an aside to make a running commentary here. Jesus is talking to this religious leader. He's uncovering something about him. He's entering into a process in this conversation, but he's also speaking to us. He says, if you do this, you will live. Remember last week, we came to the big key thought. It's not about me. It's not about me. If life is focused and centered on the self, what happens? We end up purposeless. We end up hopeless, and we end up in a series of broken relationships. Jesus says, if you put Jesus at the center, if you put God at the center of your life, you will live. And so this man is starting to feel a little bit of conviction. And so he says, and it says right here in the text, wanting to justify himself. Okay, Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now you don't read this in the text, but I I imagine Jesus just had a smile at this moment. Just let me tell you a story. There was a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers, and they stripped him, and they beat him, and they fled, leaving him half dead. Verse 31, a priest happened to be going down that road. Let's unpack that real quick. A priest. So in today's vernacular, that would be the pastor. This would be myself. This would be Pastor Gordon, Pastor Ed. We're walking down the road, and it's not like we have a purpose there. It says we just happened to be walking down that road. Now, you would expect, and and the Pharisee, the leader in the law here, would expect that the, the hero of the story is going to be the priest, right? The hero of the story is going to be the pastor, but instead, the pastor walks on the other side of the road. He says, I'm busy, busy, dreadfully busy. I have to go feed the homeless. I have to go lead Sunday school. I've got to go pray. I've got to go do things for God, and so I don't have time for you. And so the next verse, it says a Levite comes by, a Levite. This would be the worship leader. This would be the associate pastor of the day. You know, the pastor didn't get it right, but, but for sure the musician would. The musician is an artist. He, he's deeply sensitive. He cares more about people, right? But it says that the Levite passes and walks on the other side. And then verse 33, this would have been where Jesus really hit the bullseye on this religious expert. It says, but a Samaritan was on a journey. Now, I don't want to spend too long and labor on the the history between the Jews and the Samaritans, but needless to say, this would not be the expected hero of the story. The religious leader would have looked down on the Samaritans very, very much. They would have considered them lesser human beings, even the enemy If we were to take this story and modernize it to today, he may have said something like, but then a devoted, radical leader of ISIS walked by. Not that the Samaritans were like ISIS, but that is how this religious leader would have received this. This would have caused him to stir something deep down inside. This would have affected him in a visceral way. And what happens 
says the Samaritan, first of all, was on a journey. He didn't just happen down the road. He had a destination. He had something he was doing. But even still, when he saw the man, and this word is key, he had compassion, compassion on him. He went over to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine, which would have been the medicines of the day. And then he put him on his own animal. He put him in his vehicle, even though he might bleed on the seats. He brought him to an inn, which would be, at the time, the, the hospital. They didn't have a hospital system. So he takes him to the hospital, and he says, take care of this man. And then the next day, he pulls out a sum of money, and he says, look, make sure this covers his, his medical bills. And if it doesn't, when I come back, I will cover the rest. So this man not only took time out of his busy schedule while he was on a journey. He not only put him in his own vehicle and he walked, making sure that the other person was taken care of, but now he's offered to pay all of his medical bills. If you've been to a hospital recently, you know that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> Whatever you spend, I will reimburse, he says. And then Jesus looks at the man. And he says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor? And look at, the, look at the religious leader's response. Not what he says, but what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, why the Samaritan, of course. He can't even bring himself to use that word. He can't even imagine a scenario in which the Samaritan was the hero of the story. And so what's he say? Through clenched teeth, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus simply looks at him, then go and do the same. You see, this man had something other than God at the center of his life, even though he was a religious leader who was supposed to help others find a relationship with God. Instead, it was all about him. It was all about me. And I want you to notice something really important here because Jesus' end game was always to get people to center their lives on God. But he often did not start there. He would often start right where they were. And this is what we see him doing with this religious leader. He starts by showing the man what's going on. He starts with a recalibration, a recentering process. For the men he, he met who were Pharisees, he called them out. For those who were caught in a disease or, or trapped in sin, he, he led them to something where they were healed, where they were freed first. For the woman caught in adultery, rather than saying, you're right, this woman should be stoned to death, what does he do? He meets her in her moment of need before he says, and now go and sin no more. You see, Jesus always meets us right where we are. Whether we're helpless and hopeless, or whether we're like this religious leader and think that our lives are the center of the story. And then, after he meets us where we are, he helps us to begin to focus our lives on him. You know, I want you to notice something in this text, and I just want to be honest, because there's something in here I am challenged by. Because the hero of the story, you want to be the pastor, right? The religious leader, the good, you know, leader of, of men. And he's not. He says, I'm... I'm busy. If you've ever watched Veggie Tales, busy, busy, dreadfully busy, much, much too busy for you. And you know, I find in my own heart sometimes that I'm so busy doing things for God that occasionally I miss what God is doing. I see someone in need and I think, oh, I should help that person, but oh, I got to get to a Bible study. I got to go lead a meeting. I got to go do something. And I find in this story a conviction and a moment where I say, I've got to look at my own heart. But I also find in this story a conviction for us who follow Jesus because we are the modern day version of what the Pharisees were. We are supposed to be the ones who reveal Jesus to others. We are supposed to be the ones who help. And that's the key thought that I want to leave you with today. Last week's was, it's not about me. This week, why are we here? We are here to help. We are here to help. I want to focus on just the first two words of our new vision statement, helping people live Jesus-centered lives. 
Because the goal is that we want people living Jesus-centered lives, but if we don't start with helping people, no one will care about the Jesus-centered life we have to offer. If we don't start by meeting people, even ourselves and our brokenness, where they are, it will be a very difficult task to lead them to Jesus. But Jesus always started by helping people. And then he said, and now let me show you a better way. This story challenges me because I've seen it lived out. And I've owned up to my stuff as a pastor. Sometimes I'm too busy doing things for God to see what God is doing. But remember, we together, we are what the Pharisees would be in a modern day context. And sometimes we get a reputation that we are not here to help. Maybe we're here to condemn. Maybe we're here to be haughty. Maybe we're here because we are the center of our story. But a lot of times if you go and ask people, what are Christians on this earth for? The word here to help would not start the sentence or the story. I have a story that convicts me. When I was uh, in seminary, when I was training for ministry at Asbury Theological Seminary, I was in Kentucky, and I was in the buckle of the Bible belts. And I had started working a couple years earlier as a waiter. That was how I was putting myself through school. It was how I was taking care of my soon-to-be family at the time I was preparing for marriage. And I discovered something, something that just as we're to rediscovering the purpose that we had from the very beginning I had been told for years. You see, my mother was a, a waitress, a bartender. She worked in the human services industry for many years. And I remember growing up every Sunday, my mom going, I do not want to go to work today. Why? The Christians. The Christians are coming. <laughs> and I said, it cannot be. This isn't the story that we live. And so I became a waiter, and guess what? The Christians, they ruined everything. I remember I was serving a table. It was a young couple. They had these little kids, nice, beautiful young family. And I took their drink order, and then I walked to go back to the back to get their drinks. And I just happened to turn and look. And I noticed that the father of the family was leading them in prayer. And in that moment, something rose up in my heart. And I'll tell you, this is unfiltered, uncensored. These are the exact words that went across my mind. I went, oh, crap. They are Christians. <sighs> I can do this. Because the reality is, what I discovered is that Christians, when we go out to eat, oftentimes, unfortunately, let's own up to this, we're the least forgiving, the most demanding. And at the end of the meal, we're also the least generous as well. And I would, I would say that... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I would say that this is not true. This is not our story except for the fact that I served for three years in that industry and every Sunday, without question, even those of us who were believers, it was like, oh man, it's Sunday. We have to deal with the church crowds. A couple years ago, I was preaching this similar message at the church I was at, Meadow Park, during our 50th anniversary, and before I did, I, I just, I wanted this to not be true so much that I put the idea before the staff of what I was going to preach, and our director of administration spoke up, and I was waiting for him to say, Lee, that's not true. You can't say that, but instead he said, let me tell you a story. When I was at a former church, my pastor and I were sitting down for a lunch meeting, and, and we noticed someone from our congregation there, and so we kind of watched. We kind of kept our eyes on and it was a person who was well-known. He was well-known to be uh, of, of, of his own resources, let's just say. And at the end of the meal, he'd been super nice to the lady, but he left this little card. And on the card, it said this. It said, I know you were expecting a monetary tip, but what's written on this card is worth far more than that. And then it just had the words, John 3.16. The waitress came over. She picked up the card, and as Roger tells the story, she, she kind of began to tear up. And, and it wasn't because Jesus in that moment was meeting her right there, and she was so overwhelmed with the love of God. It was because somebody skipped the helping people and tried to go straight to the Jesus-centered life, and it just didn't work. You know, if that man 
before he left a card with John 3.16, had begun reading 1 John 3.16. Perhaps the story would have gone a little bit differently. 1 John 3.16 through 18 says this, We know what real love is because Jesus gave his life for us. So we ought also to give our lives up for our brothers and sisters. And if someone has enough money to live well and yet sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion. Notice it's the same word as what the Samaritan showed, compassion. How can God's love be in that person? Verse 18, dear children, let us not merely say that we love each other. Let us show it by the truths of our actions. I want this to not be true. And I want you to know that this isn't the, the whole of the story. There, there are certainly exceptions to the rule, but the exceptions to the rule should be the stingy Christians and not the generous Christians. And so I, I gave this message as a part of our 50th anniversary, and one of our small groups took it to heart. We introduced these little cards, and on the front of them, they just simply said, you are loved, hashtag you are loved. And they took these cards, and the rule was, if you took one, you had to do something practical and loving for someone else before you could give it to them. And if you left it with a tip, not as a tip, it had to be the most generous tip you've ever given, and you had to have been the best table your server ever had. And so this small group from, from Meadow Park went to Steak and Shake. I don't know if you've ever been to Steak and Shake. Quality is a little bit above McDonald's. Prices are around McDonald's pricing, and yet they give you real plates, real silverware, and you have a real waiter who's working for, you know, your tips. And, you know, my wife and I have eaten there with both of our kids and walked away paying $15 for our meal. So I can imagine what these people are, are making if, if they're getting 10 or, or standard 20%. That's like pennies on the dollar. And so this small group got together, they left a card, and with it, they left $90 on a $36 meal. And they just got up, they walked out the door, they, they left, and outside they began to congregate, they began to talk about the experience, and they, they had something happen. Their server came out the door, and he was crying. And he began to tell him his story, he said, you guys have no idea, you had no way of knowing, but... You see, my family and I are moving to Atlanta, Georgia, and we don't have the money to make the trip. We have to be there in two weeks, and so I am working every single shift, morning, noon, night, and overnight that I can pick up to make sure we have enough to get there. You just helped. They showed the love of God in that moment, and the reality is if we are going to help others live Jesus-centered lives. We have to start with the fact that we are here to help. We are here to help. But the amazing thing is, Sloan's Lake Community Church has a 129 and a half year history of being generous, of being here to help. Our very first act that created the church was that seed planted of generosity that was for, lo for lost people and the people God misses most right here in Denver, Colorado. And over the course of our 130-year history, we have been living that out more and more. And so this isn't anything new that you're hearing. It's simply a challenge to reclaim and remember who we are and who we are called to be. Because it's all about the heart. It's all about being here to help. And so this week, you're going to have an opportunity. I'm going to give you a challenge to help. Our ushers are going to begin handing out little cards. And on the front of them, all they have is a hashtag, and you are loved. And what I believe God is going to do for you sometime this week is that he is going to give you an opportunity where you will see someone in need. And you can be like the pastor and the priest and the Levite in this story, and you can take that opportunity to step to the other side of the road and walk by. You can put up your Bible and say, I'm busy, busy, much, much too busy for you. Or... You can remember and reclaim the truth that we are here to help. And so the rules to the card are simple. If you take one, you have to give it to someone in the next week. But before you can give it to them, you have to do something practical and loving for them. And if you leave it with a tip, 
You need to be the most forgiving table, the most generous table, the most patient table that your waiter or waitress has ever seen because ask anyone in the food service industry, we have a reputation that we need to fix. Hmm. This past Sunday, Sunday evening last week at 10 o'clock at night, I got a text message from my mother. She said, Lee, you've got to see what was on the news. And so she you know, encouraged me to, to Google Casper's news segments. A little bit of backstory. Right before Christmas 2016, I was invited to speak at my home church, Highland Park Community Church in Casper, Wyoming. And I introduced these cards. You can tell I love them. They, they do magical things. <laughs> I introduced these cards to that congregation there. Six months later, the news did a feature. All around Casper, there's these little cards going around. And servers are getting them. And people are treating them nice. And they're tipping generously. And they can't figure out why. They can't figure out who. They just think that some church is doing something amazing. And it was so important to talk about that they put it on the news. It's amazing what can happen when we together make a disproportionate impact in people's lives. And so this card, this little act, it might just be mowing someone else's yard. Maybe your, your neighbor's grass gets high and they can't do it as much for themselves anymore. So you just go and mow their yard. You don't know the difference that might make. Because see, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, we saw that person's brokenness. We saw their need. We saw that they were broken and beat up and left for dead on the side of the road. But when you look at someone else, you don't know the battles that they face. You don't know if they're working a, a service job because they are the only parent they ha that their children have and they have to put food on the table. You don't know if they're, they're working that public service job, that digging of a ditch, that whatever, because they are trying to get somewhere else in their life. They're trying to not be who they were in the past and reclaim a better future. Our role should be that we are there to help them, to help them live a better life. <laughs> Because we know that Jesus is the one who provides life. So the question that we're asking in this series is simply, why are we here? And I wanted that to mean this. Why are we, as Sloan's Lake Community Church, in our 129 and a half year history, here in this neighborhood? This week, unsolicitedly, I had someone email me and say, I don't know if you're interested, but if so, I will gladly give you $3.65 million for the building that you guys own. And I went, huh, that's a little bit of money. I've probably never seen that amount in my life before, if I were honest. I've sold that amount as, as a salesman, but I've never seen that amount. But as I started thinking about it, you know, maybe the elders will have a different opinion on this, but I started thinking about it. I ask the question, why are we here? Why are we in this neighborhood? And if the answer is that we are here to help, we are here to make a disproportionate impact, we are here to let the neighbors around us know that Jesus' life is the best life they could possibly live, then rather than divest, I think maybe it's time for us to invest back in our community. Because when Jesus spoke his final words, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he said, go, go into all the nations, all the ethnicities, all of the people, and make disciples. And you know what? Every church's vision statement is a basic version of that right there. But if you line that up with what we are now saying is our why, we are here to help people. That's our go. Live Jesus-centered lives is making disciples. And so next week, we're going to talk about what it means to make disciples. But this week, may our hearts break for our community, and may we be here to help. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, first of all, I want to repent myself of any moment where I have been the priest in this story where I've been the pastor who walks by someone else in their need and doesn't even notice, or even worse, I notice, but I've got so many excuses for why I'm doing good things for you that I miss what you are doing. And God, as a, as a body, Lord, we have a, an amazing history of generosity. We have an amazing history of a heart to reach those people who you miss. 
So may we simply rediscover this purpose for each and every one of us. And God, as we go back into our community with these little cards, these cards are, are nothing. They, they have no power in and of themselves. But God, the power is when we together band together to make a disproportionate impact in people's lives. When they see that we are here to help, then they will listen to the message of Jesus. So may we have a heart for our community. May we have a heart for our waiter or waitress. May we have a heart for that person in front of us who we just want to lay into our horn and get them to go. May we begin to see those who are broken and also the areas in our own lives where we have placed ourselves at the center. And may we recenter our lives on you because you are our hope, our purpose, and the source of our community. It's in your holy name we pray, Jesus. Amen.